Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm in a strange position of simultaneously being a guest in your country and at least partially hosting this event. But thank you for coming and also thank you for hosting me. Everybody's been most kind. I want to take just a few minutes to give perhaps a little bit of, of detail on what we've been talking about today, which is to say we're talking about biodiversity data for Rwanda. And so let's look at kind of where things stand right now, okay? Um, I want to talk about a, a, a concept that uh, a couple of us put out in the literature a few years ago, which we called we call it DAK, or Digital Accessible Knowledge. And so this is information, data, that are in digital formats, which means to say they can be copied in infinitely without any loss or any cost. They have to be accessible so that, that anybody with interest in those data or in that information can uh, discover the data and assemble them into data sets that fit their particular needs. And uh, knowledge in the sense of being integrated with other data, because one data point on its own is not particularly useful. It's only when the that one data point is, is interpreted in the context of many data points that it really becomes knowledge. So this is just a a concept that, that we put out there as, as an idea for um, how can we measure our success in these biodiversity informa information facilities. So I went to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility website and I simply asked for all data from Rwanda. Okay, and you get data in this sort of form, um, just a big table the table includes geographic coordinates, so we can, we can look at the data as a map also. And right away, you can see that our data from Rwanda have some problems, right? This is very, very typical. This isn't a criticism. This is just reality. Anytime you have a data set bigger than maybe two records, there's going to be some error in it, okay? And so you can see, for example, here is this, this point in the middle of the Gulf of Guinea. That is when people put zero, zero for latitude and longitude as a way of saying, I don't have a latitude and longitude. Okay, so this isn't a problem. This is just reality. Now obviously, we're interested in that area. And I'll show you a map of that in a moment. Um, Right now, there are about 125,000 data records available for Rwanda. And you've heard a bit about the Center of Excellence in Biodiversity and Natural Resources Management um, already. But you can see that our own um, Beth Kaplan is the, the point of contact. And just on a more personal note, I'll point out that uh, Yvette Umurungi is the, the technical point of contact, and Yvette was a veteran of a previous biodiversity information, informatics training curriculum, actually two courses, and she was one of our, our return uh, trainees, so we're very proud that she's now uh, working in this capacity. Um, so there's a map of Rwanda with those data from Rwanda. You can still see some problems, right? You can still see some records that are falling outside of the country, but that are referred to the country. And that either means it's something, let's say, from the Congo that has the wrong geographic coordinate, and the, well, no, sorry, the wrong country label, or it's something that is from Rwanda and has the wrong geographic coordinate. Again, that's part of life. And that's part of what, we're, what we learn to do in these courses is to pick out, signal those, those data records that have problems, improve them, and return them to the, the data stash that everybody can access. 
Um, in this map, what I did was I colored uh, record or sites that have between one and 10 records with X's, between 10 and 100 with white dots, between 100 and 1,000 with yellow dots, and above 1,000 records with red dots. And so right away, I want you to notice a bunch of things off of this map. Anybody know where the major roads are in Rwanda? This is my first time in Rwanda outside of the, outside of the airport. Um, but I can tell you what the major conduits of the road system look like, OK? Bio uh, zoologists call this the lazy botanist syndrome. That's a joke. Um, but indeed, road systems and, and distance to road systems explain a lot of the geographic distribution of our biodiversity sampling. But also, you can see that we have very few sites, one, two, three, four, five up in the, in the northwest. Uh, but we have very few sites where we have a lot of data. OK? And so spatially, we've spread our data out such that we have a lot of density only in a few places. Now let's look taxonomically. We basically have two taxa represented. We have chordates, this is at the level of phyla, and tracheophyta, and a few arthropods. Okay, and let's look within chordates, and what we have is birds. Some mammals, some fish. Okay, so just this slide shows you the imbalances and the gaps. Okay, it shows you that biodiversity information for, one, for Rwanda is concentrated amongst plants and birds, basically, in a very few places with big gaps. Okay, again, this isn't a criticism, this is reality. Same thing happens for Kansas, where I live. Okay, we have a few sites that are well known and lots of sites that are poorly known. We have a few taxa that are well known and lots of taxa that aren't. So, what do these DAK, Digital Accessible Knowledge uh, Gaps, look like? Well, we generally have a pretty massive taxon bias, okay? Especially large charismatic vertebrates tend to be massively overrepresented. We have a, a history bias where we usually lose the older records. We have spatial biases in that we, we know most about places that are accessible. And then we have big gaps in places that aren't accessible easily. And what this actually brings us to a very strange paradox. The scale at which management and conservation becomes most relevant and data can inform those decisions most precisely is finer and finer spatial scales. And yet as we go in our biodiversity data to finer and finer spatial scales, our degree of knowledge declines to zero very quickly. And that's everywhere on Earth. If you try to take biodiversity knowledge down to a square kilometer, then the, the percentage of square kilometers in your region, wherever it may be on Earth, that are well known and well documented, goes to zero very quickly. So we're in a very difficult bind here. And again, not just Rwanda. All the countries that are represented in this room and all the countries around the world have this problem. So the Biodiversity Informatics Training Curriculum was conceived back in 2012 as one small effort to remedy some of these problems. Um, We've been fortunate to count on funding from the JRS Foundation uh, since then. Um, in the first generation of biodiversity informatics training curriculum courses, we had courses in Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, Ghana, and Cameroon. 
Um, it was a whirlwind introduction for me to Africa. It's been wonderful, but I really hadn't traveled in Africa before then, so it's been quite a pleasure to, to meet this continent. Uh, but essentially what we've been aiming to do is to provide direct in-person training, essentially linking up experts with interested and motivated young scientists across Africa. And we've, let's say we've been able to touch between 100 and 200 people that way. We also set out to provide access to digital media, which obviously aren't as good as far as training because they're not in person. That's the reason for the camera over here. Um, but to give you an example, the, the videos that make up the BITC have now seen almost a quarter million views. And so we're reaching a lot more people. Um, there we go. And then kind of the most difficult objective that we had, because the JRS didn't fund this, but we really wanted to provide or help to provide avenues for advanced study by our participants. To be very honest with you, I personally hate two-week training courses. I want five-year training courses, okay? I want people in doctoral programs, master's programs, that can provide in-depth training and leave the trainee with the ability to direct the research and not just do it. So this is something that we have done informally, somewhat successfully. For example, my friend Jesse Owino has now, is now Dr. Jesse. And I doubt we had any part in that success because he would have been successful regardless, but maybe we helped slightly. And so that sort of situation, again, it's not funded, but we're very much hoping to, um, hope to, to open doors to trainees and experts meeting up and establishing longer-term relationships. So all the results of BITC1 were assembled into a training curriculum. It's published, it's openly available. All the materials are online, openly available. Um, and it's essentially um, the lecture material for what would approximately be a master's degree program. And in, in fact, in Benin, it's been implemented as a master's degree, degree program. And we have Gabrielle here from Benin, from that program. Uh, it's in the midst of its second generation of students, is that correct? Okay. Um, so so this, is, this is material that can be used formally or informally, but it's intended to provide um, tools towards being able to um, function um, at a moderate to high level in this field of, of biodiversity informatics. So I'm gonna conclude with just some thoughts, and this is thoughts about what, what all of the previous speakers have been discussing, which is how do you get Rwanda, well it's already started, but how do you get it up to critical mass and functioning at a, at a high level in this field of, of uh, accumulating, curating biodiversity data and putting those biodiversity data to good use. So essentially sets of tasks or sets of challenges. One is certainly uh, that of digitizing and making available the data that are here within Rwanda. And so a very good example of that is what Beth told us about with capturing the data from the, the National Herbarium Collection. There's a second set of challenges, which is um, that of creating new data which is to say it may be updating what's already in the herbarium, it may be extending to other taxonomic groups, other sites, et cetera, but you all are here and you, you should uh, lead the, the study and documentation of the Rwandan biota. 
So that's a second set of challenges. And then a third one, which is a strange one, and that has been referred to maybe tangentially so far. Remember that historical gap. The data you have available right now are largely new. Where are the old data? Well, they're generally sitting in institutions in Europe and North America. They're often sitting there in analog formats, not digital. And so they don't become part of this information flow. Now, what I put up here is that it requires novel solutions. Well, the solution to date has been essentially wait for the uh, institution that holds those herbarium sheets or those uh, mammal specimens or whatever, wait for them to prioritize digital capture and sharing of the data for your region. And that can be very frustrating because it may not be their priority even though it is your priority. And so an, one novel solution um, and Several groups have been exploring this sort of solution, um, including a BITC training course that focused on this. But one solution is to build partnerships with those institutions that own the old Rwandan data. And via those partnerships, for Rwanda to take charge of digitizing those data. I'll give you an example. Five herbaria in West Africa um, got together, went to the JRS Biodiversity Foundation and asked for funding. And the, the, the plan was to digitize and make completely available the data from those five herbaria in West Africa, but also to work in partnership with five herbaria across Europe and North America wherein the European and North American herbaria would provide images of their specimens that came from West Africa, and the West Africans would digitize those data, create data resources that are available to them and useful to them, and return the data back to, to the host institutions because the data should remain with the specimens, but being that they're digital, copies are infinite. And so essentially what the West African Plants Project achieved was a 40 to 50% increase in the data on West African plants that was available openly globally. And so it's something they're very proud of and rightfully so. So this is, a, this is an interesting and odd challenge you have to know where the out-of-country resources that are relevant to your country are. You have to build the partnerships, and that's not always easy. In those partnerships, find the funding. But essentially, take charge of this challenge rather than sitting frustrated, waiting for somebody else to make your interests a priority. Um, a final challenge that I'll point out is that of creating and supporting effective institutions in this field. And that means um, doctoral level training, master's level training, but high level training for Rwandan scientists and funding for stable positions for those scientists so that they can put their skills to work for the good of your country. And everything I've just said about Rwanda applies to every one of the countries around the table. So with that, I'll stop. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't know about this, but we as researchers or probably scholars uh, find it hard probably be granted research permits to do your data collection. Um, there are certain requirements that probably you don't need or fulfill, but you may have uh, an interest in collecting data about a 
a certain species, or tree species, or an animal species. Um, probably your advice of how we can uh, have access to those climates. But uh, another question I have is why do we have a uh, lack of published research results? You know, in terms of biodiversity conservation or probably environmental conservation as a whole. And I always hear people, you know, speaking about uh, research, research, research. But where do we put indigenous knowledge in terms of uh, collecting our data? Are we saying it's outdated and it's not relevant, uh, or will we just turn a blind eye to it? And the last. <laughs> <laughs> this is a memory test, right? Yes. Um, the use of open source tools or software mm -hmm. in terms of data collections. You know, governments are so skeptical about it. You know, when you present something on open source, they're like, ah, you know, we can do that because probably everyone has access to that. You know, so what? How do we tackle the trust issues with the government? You gave me a lot to to think about. The first one was yeah, process. research permits. I think that goes very much hand in hand with the training, which is to say part of training in biodiversity informatics or biodiversity science in general is that of effective writing. And a lot of proposals and permit requests and things like that get turned down just because we don't write effectively all the time. Um, but also it goes in ha hand in hand with having those institutions. If if somebody comes as a private citizen, maybe those permits aren't very easy to get. But if somebody comes from the University of Rwanda, which we had an introduction to earlier, or the, uh, the National Biodiversity Information Facility of whichever country, I think there's a little bit more weight given to those, those requests. Um, I'm gonna jump forward. We, uh, lack, lack, well, lack of published results. Again, one thing that you will see is if you look back into history, well, let me, let me put this in a, in a Mexican context. My, I'm from the US, but I've worked for decades in Mexico. And if you look back into the 20th century, first half of the 20th century, most of the research on Mexican biodiversity was being done by North Americans. And as you come forward in the 20th century, um, you see a very interesting transition, whereas of about 20 years ago, the research became dominated by Mexican scientists. And I think the same transitions are happening here. But you, you, you essentially end up um, depending on, well, in the past, one depended on external scientists. And now, I mean, look around the room. I think I'm the person with the most gray hair here, right? So this is a situation where there's a lot of young people, a lot of young scientists, a lot of young talent. And that should translate into research publications. You asked about traditional knowledge, would I discard it? By no means. I think it requires essentially the right context. So I've seen um, Western scientists try to take traditional knowledge and kind of fit it into the boxes of our kind of data. It doesn't work. Rather, it's a, it's a matter of, of acquiring a deep enough knowledge of the traditions and of the culture and essentially understanding the concept in, or the context in which um, they have accumulated that knowledge and they use that knowledge. So it's, it's, not, it's not in the same context, it's not in the same currency. And then your last question was about open source tools. Here's where I would argue rather strenuously that we should be using only open source tools. Um, and I know there's a, maybe a credibility gap when you go and you know, speak to the minister or, or something, but those tools are crucially important because they're a currency that 
everybody can inspect and everybody can use. Uh, so, you know, these data resources, the, the, the GBIF and um, Sanbi's data resources, for example, those are crucial because maybe some entity produces a report. If those data are open source, then I can go back and replicate their analyses. That's crucial for, for example, environment, environmental impact statements. Whereas if those data are proprietary or, or um, private property, I have no way of checking or reanalyzing or reinterpreting their information. And the same with, with the tools that we use for analysis. Um, very simply, you know, if you're using the, the open source, freely available tools, then everybody can implement them. Okay?